so welcome to just uh, welcome to 2022 it's second uh, class of of the year and uh, here we are still in the uh, still in the height of the pandemic although it's kind of it's morphed Hope there are some some light at the end of the tunnel but um, we thought that before so we can't we can't take anything for granted but hopefully we may be kind of moving moving towards that's that's my my hope and, uh, back to something like uh, something like normal or uh, not exactly the same but anyway it's good to it's always it's been a great <coughs> gift i think to over this last almost two years now it's like 22 months to be able to be together in this way <coughs> excuse me and one of the blessings is we have so many people joining us from outside of our area who wouldn't be able to make it to northwest dc to you know our, our classes there and uh, we have people from canada and from the west coast and from florida and and vermont and even even zurich switzerland so yeah so that's been a great that's been a great gift and wonderful thing is that, that the community the center for mindful living which is part of the insight meditation community of washington has really and and i think i see imcw more generally has really thrived and 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 flourished through um through the pandemic you know through the offerings going on i don't think it was you know probably the some unevenness there as well but we but it's been um you know many many classes and retreats being offered including the one we one we just did at the new year's online there's the hope of going back in person but we you know that's still a bit up in the air so Again, welcome everyone. And if you're new, um, I'm Hugh Byrne, um, teach with the Center CML, Center for Mindful Living and Insight Meditate, IMCW. And I've been teaching with IMCW for almost 20 years now and, and do these weekly classes and courses. And we'll share some things about, um, about what I have, have coming up and also other offerings from the Center coming up and um, yeah if you are new um, the format for this for the class is pretty straightforward I think what well, we kind of tweak it a little bit and I've just tweaked it a bit I think my intention is to begin with a maybe a 15 minute meditation or so you know long enough hopefully to get settled and then to um, then to have a short talk, a reflection. I think today will be, you know, relatively, you know, 20 minutes or so. What I'd like to explore today is um, working with the difficulties in meditation and, and in daily life. I think that's something that we're all, all continually confronting, you know, however long we've practiced difficulties and obstacles and hindrances will always come up and so how do we how do we work with with the the joys and the sorrows as they as they arise and so reflect on that today we'll have some movement emily will lead, lead us in some movement and we'll have um, some time for sharing you know either in small groups or in the larger in the full group and we'll we'll finish with a meditation, maybe uh, you know, hopefully a ten or fifteen minute meditation to to finish, depending on time. So again, welcome everyone. Um, lots of familiar faces joining us. Nice to see you see you all. And. Taking in all of all of us here together, and we'll begin with um, <clears throat> we'll begin with a meditation. So I invite you to find a posture that's relaxed and comfortable. Okay. 
Let yourself settle in, taking your seat. You might, if you're comfortable doing so, let your eyes close, let your attention come inward. Or if you prefer just keeping the eyes open with a, a soft, unfocused gaze. And let your attention drop down out of the kind of the top of the head, the thinking mode, the brain where we, a lot of our energy goes, a lot of our attention goes down into the body. You feel the contact of your body, the weight of your body pressing down on the buttocks, on your thighs, on your feet. Feeling the contact of your body with the surface beneath you. The air on your skin, the contact with your clothing. Feel your own breathing. And inviting the shoulders to relax and let the chest be open so you can, can breathe easily. And as a way of helping us settle, you might take a few longer, deeper breaths. Take a nice deep in breath. Filling the chest, filling the lungs. And then a long, slow out breath. So releasing, letting go. Imagine you're breathing out any stresses, any worries, any cares from the day or from the week. Just letting them go as you breathe out. Breathing in, calming the body. Breathing out, calming the mind. Letting the breath, the deeper breathing, help you settle and relax into being here. be helpful to put a hand on your heart, maybe the other, another on the, the other on the belly. Just connect with yourself, just letting yourself be here, feeling this life, this breath, this consciousness, breathing, wishing yourself well. I take a moment to reflect on your intention, your intention to, in being here today. Just why, why it matters, <coughs> excuse me, why it matters to you to be here. Maybe think about a, any aspiration you may have, how you want to show up today. Is there a particular quality that you'd like to develop or cultivate? You know, maybe just being kind to yourself or, or accepting whatever comes up, meeting it with kindness. 
whatever it might be for you. It's what brings you here and how you want to show up, your aspirations or intentions for today. Allow yourself to open to whatever is present right now. Whatever's present in the body, the emotions, the heart, the mind. See if you can make space for whatever, whatever's here right now, whatever's showing up. And you meet it with kindness and with acceptance. might reflect on Martha Postlethwaite's poem, Clearing. She says, do not try to save the whole world or do anything grandiose. Instead, create a clearing in the dense forest of your life and wait there patiently until the song that is yours alone to sing falls into your open cupped hands and you recognize and greet it. Only then will you know how to give yourself to this world so worthy of rescue. So I might think of this space as a clearing, a clearing in the dense forest of our lives and just waiting and with a receptive awareness but whatever comes out of the being here, being present, opening to our experience, <clears throat> whatever insight or kindness might come, that we may go back into our lives, perhaps more supported, more resilient, more wise, more kind. If you can let your attitude, your orientation be one of, of kindness and acceptance to whatever, whatever's arising, whatever's appearing you know, from within and from without, from what's coming from the world, images and sounds and smells and tastes, and what's coming from within, the thoughts, the emotions, sensations. Just can you meet them with an e evenness of mind, with a steadiness, with kindness and acceptance?
when you say yes to whatever is, whatever's appearing, whatever's present. Welcome the guests as Rumi speaks to in the guest house. It's treat it, treating each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. If it's helpful, you might let the breath be a, a home base for your attention and where you rest your awareness and where you come back to when the mind goes off. Just come back to that, that grounding, that base here. When you find the mind has been pulled into thought, as some energy pulls you to thinking about the future or looking back on something that happened and maybe ruminating over it or reliving it in the mind, or just going off kind of into daydreams. When you notice that, not to make it in any way a problem, but just kindly and gently letting your attention come back. Come back to the body, the breath, come back to this moment. The important part of this practice, this training, is what William James spoke about as bringing back a wandering attention. So it would be it would be a training par ex, an education par excellence, just bringing the attention back, coming back when the mind goes off, to be able to do that, to not be lost in worries and plans and stories and memories and daydreams and all the ways that we can get kind of pulled away pulled into kind of narrative that is not really real you know it's uh, 
our imagination into or even the actual things that are happening that we might be concerned about. You know, we can proliferate from them. We create scenarios, mostly negative. So just to notice the mind's tendency to do that, kind of habitual tendency of the mind. And then each time we just kindly and gently come back. The attitude is important. <clears throat> the kindness, the friendliness, is coming back, this moment, this breath. Here and now. T.S. Eliot said, a condition of complete simplicity costing not less than everything. Condition of complete simplicity, just this being here, opening to what's present. <clears throat> If you can allow your attitude, your orientation to your experience to be one of kindness. So that all of the practice is really imbued with kindness. And wise effort. As the Buddha said, not too tight, not too loose. You know, noticing if we're kind of over-efforting, <clears throat> maybe bringing in some tension and contraction. We can just incline ourselves back towards a more balanced state. Or if we seem to be kind of drifting or slouching, just to notice that maybe bring some energy in maybe some deeper breaths, opening the eyes, you know, whatever helps you to be more fully here. with a uh, piece of um, 
one of uh, Rilke's letters to a young poet. Um, really about working with difficulties in life. Kind of was what I want to talk about in a few minutes. He says, we have no reason to harbor any mistrust against our world, for it is not against us. If it has terrors, they are our terrors. If it has abysses, these abysses belong to us. If there are dangers, we must try to love them. And if only we arrange our life in accordance with the principle which tells us that we must always trust in the difficult, then what now appears to us as the most alien will become our most intimate and trusted experience. How could we forget those ancient myths that stand at the beginning of all races, the myths about dragons that at the last moment are transformed into princesses? Perhaps all the dragons in our lives are princesses who are only waiting to see us act just once with beauty and courage. Perhaps everything that frightens us is in its deepest essence, <clears throat> something helpless that wants our love. Perhaps everything that frightens us is, in its deepest essence, something helpless that wants our love. Take your time coming, bringing your awareness into your room, your space, and back into, into the group here together. So welcome, everyone. Welcome back and welcome those who joined us after we started. Welcome. So that... Um, letter from, or part of a letter from, uh, from Rilke to the aspiring young poet writer, um, kind of can be the starting point of, um, of the reflection for today, which is about opening to the difficult, opening to the difficult. And what I'd begin is, with is that one of the most important skills and practices in our in, in mindfulness meditation is to see difficulties as really a, an essential part of the path. To see what we normally relate to as problems as really an essential part of waking up and finding freedom from suffering. So even more than a, than a skill or a practice, seeing the difficult as part of the path is really a whole orientation towards our life and our experience. It's kind of a way of way of being and a way of seeing. It's not just kind of one skill. It's, a, it's more than just a, a skill or a technique that we can cultivate. Um, you know, when we experience, <coughs> excuse me, when we experience unpleasant situations or feelings, our default tends to be to push them away, to avoid them or get rid of them. You know, I don't like this. 
you know there's a kind of a pushing away you know either sometimes it's repression sometimes it's avoiding or escaping but it's always that same sense of i don't like this i don't want this and underlying that a kind of idea this shouldn't be happening this shouldn't be here you know this person that i don't like i don't agree with saying these things they shouldn't be saying them and <laughs> bothering me with what they're saying etc you know that's the kind of the tends to be our our, our def default and there's much in evolution you know we're probably all familiar with you know what we're learning from uh, you know about our habits and our proclivities and how much of it comes from you know the survival mode you know the, of our ancestors what they needed to do to survive in order to you know pass on their genes to the next generation um, and a key part of that is this kind of anything that's threatening or fearful we want to push it away we kind of like avoid it fight off light all of that so <laughs> we might say we come by it honestly we come by it honestly you know it's like uh it's not like bad things that we're doing it's kind of like a a kind of a natural te habitual tendency you could say um but the problem with this as we know i think is that when we approach the world with this as our main orientation you know moving towards the pleasant moving away from the unpleasant it's not a path that will lead to to freedom to letting go to happiness you know if that becomes our a kind of our dominant mode or our, our default mode, you know, always like, oh, I want this, so I move towards it. I don't like that, so I push it away. You know, up to a point, you know, it's good. I mean, we want to move out of the way of things that are really threatening. And yes, we do want to, you know, have the urge to, you know, get what we need to survive and thrive. But it's how we hold that and how we meet it that's really the key to our well being and happiness and really what i want to emphasize today is that when we take as our orientation our way of seeing if you like <clears throat> that difficulties obstacles hindrances are actually where we wake up then our difficulties then become the doorway to freedom you know, as Rilke says, always trust in the difficult, that the difficult has something to teach us. You know, if we're willing to work with it, <coughs> excuse me, if, <coughs> if we're willing to work with it wisely and skillfully, rather than kind of habitually and reactively, you know, <coughs> the, the difficulties in a way become our teachers. <coughs> In, in Zen Buddhism, they say, the obstacle is the path. The obstacle is the path. You know, which is a very different orientation than often our default kind of our default mode, rather than being a problem or a hindrance, what appears to us as an obstacle, you know, that Thing that that you know the neighbor's dog barking or you know the person we don't like or don't agree with speaking and saying things we don't like or agree with you know rather than that being an obstacle um, they be they become you know the exact place for us to wake up you know they become the opportunity for for awakening and any time we find ourselves in caught up in that, like this is a problem. This person is a problem. This situation is a problem. You know, that sense of like not liking, not wanting, this should be different, different ways it can be expressed. Whenever we get into that mode of responding, mode of being, that way of seeing, then 
you know, it can be like an like a bell to remind us, OK, this is a place where I can wake up. I can see my clinging, you know, the second noble truth. I can see my own role in this suffering I'm experiencing right now. So really calls on us to kind of shift out of that orientation of this is wrong. This is not happening to, OK, what, what can I learn? How can I grow? What am I? How, where am I clinging? What am I holding on to here? And then it becomes that doorway towards freedom, towards the greatest, you know, the deepest freedom. So the difficult provides really the perfect conditions to free ourselves from clinging and free ourselves from suffering. But it's not easy. That's why difficulties are called difficulties, because we experience them as difficult. You know, obstacles are obstacles because they appear to be in the way of where we're wanting to get to or where we're wanting to go. Um, but they're only obstacles when we're not making them the path when we're not opening to the experience, when we're not saying yes to our experience, then, then they actually do operate as obstacles. Like in Buddhism, we talk about the, in, in, the, in meditation, the five hindrances of the wanting mind, aversion, that's the pulling and the pushing, um, sloth and torpor, which is, you know, kind of leth lethargy, kind of tiredness, Restlessness and worry, you know, bodily and mental agitation, anxiety or, you know, tension and doubt, these five hindrances. There, you know, when we, when we talk about the hindrances and when we work with the hindrances, they're only hindrances if we, if we take them as real, you know, if we really say, oh, yeah, this is a problem to me this doubt or this wanting or this aversion. It's only a problem if I really believe in the hindrance. If I can open to the experience and say, okay, this is, I'm noticing doubt come up in my mind. And if I work skillfully with it, then it's no longer really a hindrance. It stops being a hindrance. If I watch the want wanting mind, and rather than being caught up in, I've got to have this to be happy. I need this. I want this. I've got to have it. When I'm caught up in that, then it is a hindrance. You know, it hinders us from seeing clearly. It hinders us from waking up. It's an obstacle. Um, but if we work with that and say, okay, noticing wanting, breathing into wanting, making space for that energy and the tightness in the body and, and the going outward, that energy, okay. Can I just see this? Can I notice the thoughts without being lost in the stories of them? You know, saying, oh, I've got to have this. Okay, see that thought, let it go. See it, let it go, come back. So if we work with the hindrances in this way, they're actually no longer hindrances. You know, that's kind of a, the Buddha's teachings of, of em emptiness. They don't have any real permanent existence. It's only when we meet them in an unskillful way, then they get that solid quality to them. Even then they're empty, but we're not seeing that. We're kind of getting hooked onto, you know, onto the experience. And, and then we get caught up in suffering. But if we actually see them, we actually see their emptiness. We see that, okay, this is just an energy, this wanting. Okay, can the wanting come and go? Can the aversion come and go? Can the doubts be just seen? You know, sometimes we bring in a helpful antidote. We bring in a loving kindness or compassion to ourselves or we change the channel in some way. So, so the obstacles are only really obstacles when we, when we get into an unskillful relationship. We're not seeing things as they really are. We're not seeing really the emptiness of things. So when we say yes to the difficulty, it provides the conditions for practice and for waking up. 
So if you happen to be feeling sad, you know, sadness is here from whatever causes and conditions led to this feeling being present. Rather than saying, I wish I wasn't sad, or I wish that relationship hadn't ended, or I wish my life was working out better than it is. We turn towards the difficulties, we turn towards that sadness. You know, we meet it, we make space for it. We recognize it, we allow it. So we, we, stay with, we stay with the feelings in the body. We come back to our direct experience and out of the stories in our mind. You know, when the stories come up, we, we can bow to them metaphorically, let them go, come back. What am I, what's, what's calling for attention now? You know, many of you are probably familiar with the RAIN practice. You know, recognize, allow, investigate. And originally it was not identified. Tara Brach kind of tweaked it towards more towards compassion, which I think is really wise, self-compassion. The nurturing, nurturing, recognize, allow, investigate, nurture. So we meet our experience in this way. Then... The thing, the thing that we thought was solid, you know, begins to dissolve because it really depends on our relationship with it, with how we, on how we meet it. And when we meet it with kindness, with acceptance, making space for it, then where does it go? You know, the energy comes and goes. But if I'm not fueling a story of sadness, then then I can just let it come and let it go. Now, there may be something, some real, you know, condition in life, we've lost a loved one, you know, and it'll come back and it will come back. But if we keep working skillfully with it, make the container, a container large enough to hold the grief, you know, work skillfully, bring, bring in loving kindness, bring in the practices that can help us to be with the difficulties, then, it can just, you know, it can come and go in, in its own time. You know, maybe it stays around, you know, but still make space for it with kindness, with care. This is really the core of, of our practice. So typically we, we live our lives caught up in pushing and pulling, this push and pull, you know, pushing away what we don't like, pushing, pulling towards us what we like. When this is our orientation, the lens through which we're looking and, and at and experiencing the world, then we suffer because life won't always give us what we like and it won't always keep away what we don't like. So if we're depending on life, you know, getting the right amount of the pull, the things we like, and the right amount of the pushing away of the things we don't like, then we're really dependent on life to, you know, ex external conditions to provide us the conditions for happiness. And if we get too much of the quote bad things, then obviously we get tossed around and we experience suffering, you know, or we don't get the things that we want or enough of the things we want. The life of the world doesn't give us that enough of what we want. Then we'll suffer you know, because we're dependent on those conditions. We want this, we don't want that, essentially. So when we're dependent on the outside conditions to provide us with happiness, then as Jack Cornfield would say, good luck on that one. You know, <laughs> good luck, because, you know, it's not going to happen. You know, it's, it, it's really, I think we know it's not going to happen. Um, But when we, when our orientation, when our way of seeing, our lens, if you like, with which we, through which we look at the world, through which we experience the world, is to see the difficult as the path, when that becomes our orientation. So I walk into my day, you walk into your day with the intention of seeing obst the obstacles as the place of waking up then it's a different way that you're gonna be in the world. 
you know, you may forget about it for a while and then get caught up in things. But if you can keep coming back to that orientation, can I see the obstacles as the path? Can I see this difficulty not as, oh, a bad thing that's happening to poor me, but rather as, okay, what happens when I open to this? What happens when I say yes to this? Then nothing is inherently a problem. This is important, worth saying again. Nothing is inherently a problem. Even the biggest things aren't inherently a problem. What would otherwise appear as problems are experienced as situations. <clears throat> what I've come to do over recent years is to try, and I don't always succeed, but to try and see everything as not a problem. You know, when I see something as a problem, I mean the problem in a problematical kind of way, you know, this is like, this is a problem, I have to solve this problem. When rather than seeing it as a problem, to see it as a situation. You know, it's, 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 it's something, it's a situation rather than a problem. That shift for me is a really meaningful one. I don't mean like when you say, Houston, we have a situation. <laughs> I mean, there we kind of, there we are treating it as a problem. But if we're treating it, it's like, okay, this is, this is what life is showing up as. This is what life is bringing right now. And as we know, stuff happens in life and go, okay, how do I meet it? So if we don't treat it as a problem, it becomes more a situation to deal with, even an opportunity for growth. You know, everything I'm saying here is a problem is an opportunity for growth, a difficulty. The, the obstacles, uh, the, the difficulties are in fact opportunities to grow. Or we can see them as challenges that are an inherent part of life. You know, there's a quote from uh, Don Juan in uh, Carlos Castaneda's um, books where he says, uh, the ordinary person, the, the, the spiritual warrior, you know, we can think of, you know, in a spiritual practitioner because a spiritual warrior sees everything as, <clears throat> excuse me, sees everything as a challenge, sees everything as a challenge. The everyday person sees everything as a blessing or a curse, a blessing or a curse, <clears throat> you know, as, as something I like or something I don't like. Rather than that, the, the spiritual warrior sees everything as, <clears throat> as, a, uh, as a challenge. Just a little kind of aside, I, I was, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I've read quite, quite a few of Castaneda's books and, you know, the likelihood is, the very likely truth is that he made the stuff up. <laughs> that seems to be the consensus. And yet there's a lot of real wisdom in there, you know. So I think of it of like, well, how do you hold something where, where there's a lot of wisdom you know, it's very much in many ways, it's like the Buddhist teachings, it's like other wisdom teachings. Um, and yet, you know, all of the evidence suggests it couldn't have been, you know, the things that he said happened couldn't have happened. And I think of it as like, well, you know, take the teachings and leave the other stuff behind. And I thought to myself, well, you know, probably it's done a lot more good than harm. You know, the teachings that he shared in, you know, the teachings of Don Juan and Journey to Ishlan and all of those books. Um, I don't think it's done harm to people in general in, in the actual teachings. You know, I think of, you know, compare, contrast it with Bernie Madoff, you know. I mean, they're there, you know, it's just a level of dishonesty that caused tremendous, tremendous harm. Anyway, that's kind of a little bit off to the side. Um, I'm just thinking, I, you know, and, and Trungpa, Rinpoche, you know, he did a lot of unskillful things. And yet the teachings, um, you know, teachings he shared, there's a tremendous amount of wisdom, wisdom in them. And so anyway, it's a larger off to an, another discussion to, to have, kind of not so much inherent to what I'm sharing here today. Um, but so depending on anything outside ourselves being a particular way, um, 
you know, is a is a path to is a path to suffering. But when we're not depending on things outside ourselves being a being any particular way, this is freedom, or at least the path to freedom. Our happiness, our well-being, our peace depend on our own actions, on how I'm meeting this experience, how I'm meeting this moment, not on anything outside ourselves. So I think I'm going to keep this relatively short today. I'm just going to touch on and maybe point to something I might talk about next week. Um, but I want to just finish this part off by inviting you to reflect on you know what is your prevailing orientation your way of seeing difficulties and obstacles how do you how do you tend to deal with them do you do you tend to look at the difficulties as a problem yeah this shouldn't be like this those people shouldn't be doing that that dog shouldn't they shouldn't be letting that dog bark all all hours of the day or night or they you know or You know, I shouldn't be having this pain right now. I shouldn't be feeling this discomfort right now. You know, does that tend to be the norm? Or is it more like, okay, this is difficult. Can I be with this? And what happens when I open to, to this experience rather than making it a problem or pushing it away? My guess is that for most of us, uh, we're somewhere in the middle. Where sometimes we're caught up in the, in the, this shouldn't be like this. I, d I don't like it. I want it to be different. And we're, we're kind of holding that there's craving in some way, as the Buddha talked about, there's craving and there's a suffering that goes with it. But maybe at other times when more, it's more like, oh, yeah, this is difficult. And it's a place of practice. It's a pl place where I can grow by being with this experience. So I'd say probably most of us, anyone who's on the path is probably somewhere, you know, on somewhere along that, that spectrum. And I think we could actually look at our practice as a movement more and more from the first to the second, more and more from really being swept up in the push and pull to less and less being caught up in the push and pull. We might still be pulled into things, you know, sometimes something comes up that's so out of the blue or so big that it, we really do get knocked off our pins, as it were, for a, for a bit. But, may, but that's not necessarily the kind of the dominant mode. The dominant mode may be for us through practice, through training, to more fully or more regularly um, see the practice, see the obstacles as the path, see the difficulties as the, the place of, of waking up. Um, and really seeing the obstacles as being at the heart of, of the path, the opportunity for us to wake up. So what I'm wanting to do today is just to really emphasize how much how important it is to make the obstacle into the path. You know, to, to see this as the very place where we're being squeezed is in fact the place, the very place for us to wake up. You know, the very place where we're, where we're most like, I don't like this, I don't want this, is the place for us to pay attention. And when we do, when we practice, when we train our mind, when we cultivate this kind, non-judging awareness is in fact the place for us to wake up. In a way, all of the teachings can be expressed in that, you know, in, that's one, one expression of it. It's really an expression of the Four Noble Truths. It's like when we cling, when we suffer. When we let go of clinging, we let go of suffering. We let go completely, we let go completely of, of suffering. So I, I would invite you to reflect on this, you know, in the, in the days ahead and, and in your own um, practice. Um, I see Ruan has put a, a question in the chat and I'm happy to kind of reflect on it. As an example, 
if during meditation I feel cold, should I put a get up and get a blanket or jacket? Or do I consider it as a thought or narrative? Is it clinging to want to free myself from cold? Is it worth using rain in such a simple situation? Great, great question. And, you know, that it's much more, that is the question. I mean, the question there is more important than my answer to the question, if I had an answer. My answer to the question is, is really the question. It's like, sit with it and see where that wanting uh, is a kind of like, is it is a kind of craving where everything has to be like, right, oh, no, I'm not comfortable. Oh, I'm not comfortable. Well, if I move over here a little bit, if I just make this adjustment, if I just put this thing on, if I just turn the heater up, and if we see ourselves, you know, in that way, always kind of moving, 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 then that's an indication that, okay, can I just let go of all of that and just sit with it? Will I freeze to death? Probably not. Can I work with this, this kind of discomfort? Probably. Is it helpful to do so? At other times it may be, yeah, it just, it's cold, you know, and I put on a jacket or I turn up the heat a little bit. So just what we're looking at is not so much the action, is that the right answer or is this the right answer? It's really asking ourselves, um, it's really looking at our own mind and saying, okay, how is the mind holding this situation? Is it holding it as like, okay, can I be with this? Even asking the questions in a sincere way is part of the path to waking up. Heather says, how do you prevent turning sitting with the difficulty into problem solving? Well, when you notice that you're getting into your head and like, I've got to solve this, or I've got to find an answer to that, then notice that as probably not a very helpful kind of thinking, not a very useful kind of thinking. And just come back to the direct experience. So very often the answer to these questions, and they're great questions, is just to come back to, okay, can I just be with this right now? And then the mind may go, but what about this? How about this? Okay, notice that there may be something very helpful in the question, or it may be another way we get into that, our heads. But the practice is really as fully as we can. Can I just be with this? Can I just hold and open to, you know, whatever it is, this tightness in the chest, breathe into it, make space for it. So. You know where I what I was gonna if with it with enough time I would was gonna just take this whole kind of reflection on this particular way of seeing and talk about ways of seeing more more generally more broadly. You know I talked last week I'm I'm, I'm just not going to talk about it now I'm just going to point to it right now, but last week I talked about three gifts of the Dharma you know, came coming out of reflections that I had at a New Year's retreat, the gift of the gift of insight, you know, which we've been talking about a lot today, leading to freedom, the gift of love, you know, opening our heart, and the gift of intention, and how these are each can also be looked at as ways of looking, ways of being in the world. And our orientation, our way of seeing, like, as I was saying, way of seeing the difficulties as the path, looking at, looking at our orientation to see, to, to love, to meta, to look at the world. I'll just give this as one example. If you were to go into your day with the orientation of loving kindness, you know, I'm going to look at the world, I'm going to look at my life through the lens of loving kindness today. Make that your practice. Then what will naturally arise is that everyone you see will become a friend. Everyone you see will become a friend. They may be a difficult friend or a troubled friend 
or even a pain in the ass friend or a happy friend or a peaceful friend, but they're a friend. You know, they're looked at through the lens of friendship, through the lens of loving kindness, through the orientation or the attitude of, of kindness, of love. So our orientation, our way of seeing is fundamental. You know, the Buddha talked about it as right view, you know, right view or wrong view. You know, the, the view of ourselves in terms of suffering is right view. The Four Noble Truths is right view. So and as I say, I'm not going to, that, that's a whole talk in itself on ways of seeing. And maybe if I may, um, uh, may, may do a, a talk on that next time. But just to come back to the talk today on the working with the difficulties, that's really a way of looking that we can, it's like a, a suit of clothes that we put on, you know. And we can take on this way of seeing as a fundamental orientation to our life. Or it's like looking at, you know, looking through eyeglasses, spectacles, you know, that will affect what we see. You know, if we have somebody else's prescription, we're going to be, able to be seeing things really weirdly. We're not, it can be like we're not seeing clearly. But if it's really we're in focus, we're going to look at things clearly. So what we're taking on is an orientation, this way of looking at the world as any difficulties arise, which will inevitably arise, we see as a doorway to waking up. So invite you to bring this into your meditation and into your um into your um into your life over the coming days yeah thank you mira in the tibetan teachings the lojong teachings turn all mishaps into the path not quite the same but many of the tibetan lojongs these kind of reflections these orientations point to the topic of the talk today i was actually when i was thinking about this talk today i was actually thinking of a lot of those tibetan teachings where they're very pithy statements you know they're reminders you know you know make you know look at you know the one i just invented myself there's probably a tibetan version of this but you know look at everyone through the eyes of love you know look at life through the eyes of love just have that there's the orientation and those tibetan teachings i think i'm going to go back and read more of those so they're very very helpful so thank you for your kind attention and um, invite um, emily to lead us in some movement we'll do some more meditation some sharing and uh, thank you let me invite you to stand up and just open to the space around you, swaying from side to side, feeling the air against your skin, the earth against your feet, and being present in this moment. And if you'd like to bring it up higher to your shoulder height, And then open up your arms to greet the day and lengthen your arms up. Grasp your left wrist in your right hand. Extend out, lengthening out to the right. Inhale up, switch wrists. Extend out to the left. Inhale up, switch wrists again, extend out to the right. Inhale up and out to the left. Inhale up, float your arms down, roll your shoulders individually. And roll them the other way. And then draw your arms up into cactus arms. Exhale, lower your hands. Inhale, rise up. Exhale, drop. Inhale, rise. Exhale, drop. 
Inhale, lifting up, extend your arms out, turn your left palm up, your right palm down, and switch, and switch. Switching back to the right, to the left last time, to the right, float your arms down, roll your shoulders. And roll them the other way. Take a moment to feel the earth beneath your feet and then bend into a flat back, placing your hands above your knees. Extend your spine out from your pelvis and then lower your head, your shoulders. Allow yourself to come into a forward fold of your liking to extend with the pull of gravity to be soft, softly falling without injury to the earth. And then press on your feet Place your hands above your knees again and roll up your spine, lifting your shoulders to your ears and let them draw down. Place your hands at the back of your waist. Extend your arms, lengthening, drawing in your shoulder blades and release back to your waist. Extending out, lifting your head. Hand back to the waist, float your arms up, do your dance, your individual moment of extension, of flexion, whatever you might wish, and then bring your hands to heart center, acknowledging each other just in this moment. Take a bath. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Lovely. Thank you. So um, I think, let me just check if anyone would like to um, like to share anything, any comments, any uh, from anything so far, the meditation, the talk, or any questions you might have. Um, And any sharing, um, Gabriella, please. Um, yeah. Good morning, Hugh, and everybody. Um, I am so grateful to be here. And uh, this is about the time that I have breakfast and feed my dog. So I normally have my camera off, um, or I have for just a moment. Um, but what came up in during your talk for me was that so much about when I don't, when I don't want things to be the way they are, whatever the situation is, many times I go into some form of self blame or self judgment, mm -hmm. um, should have done this should have done that. Uh, you know, those kinds of, um, and it's, it's, uh, it's strong. It's very strong. And it's some, you know, in some situations, yeah, maybe I should have, but that's not what I've got. And so it, it almost, it, it adds to it, right? It's the second arrow. Um, but it ends up, I end up feeling like a porcupine. It's more than just another second arrow. It's like a hundred. 
And um, so I just wanted to hear your, your, you know, feedback or, or anything thoughts about that. Um, that's, that's what comes up for me, I believe, most often, or, or some way of figuring it out, as you were alluding to earlier. Yeah, thank you, Gabriella. Um, I'm sure you're not alone. I mean, it, it, it first to just acknowledge how painful that can be to just that 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 kind of blaming ourselves, the judgment, the criticism. It's it's common in our culture. Um, you know, for some it may it can be really really painful, and it sounds like it's an area. You know it. You know, in relation to the talk, um, it's a place that's calling for attention, and so you know, you're you're raising you're raising a really good you know good question around it. Um, I just ask turn a question towards you: Is um, do you have any practices currently, or have had, to help you? when the mind goes there because you know the first thing you do there is you sh shine the spotlight of attention on okay once you kind of once you get enough awareness to see oh i'm doing that again i'm beating myself up okay what's the next step turn the spotlight and like okay can i be with this now what what how would you normally you know how would you normally respond what would your practice be for working working with that particular form of suffering? Recently, uh, for a particular event that, that just happened recently is I used a um, kind of a forgiveness practice that I, that I learned at the fall retreat and, and kind of turned it into a little bit more of a loving kindness practice. May I, I allow myself to make mistakes. I allow myself to be imperfect, I allow myself to still be learning, and and then may I accept myself as I am right now, and you know, and turning it a little bit more into that. Um, may I be free of self judgment and doubt, because those are the two that come up the most. Is the self judgment and the doubt are are hand in hand. They are twins um, that go everywhere together, and that has seemed to ease it when i'm sitting but when i'm not sitting and it, and it will ease it when i'm not sitting throughout the day it i can get hit with that and it's it's hard to pause and to recognize i guess is what's happening <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i i wanted to ask that because it, it you 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 know in some sense you know a direction you need to go. I mean, you you sent I sense you intuitively know the direction you need to go to see how the, the how harsh that criticism is and can be, and the the way a very helpful, powerful way of dealing, working with that harshness, is to bring in, you know, some some version of kindness of of loving kindness of self compassion of forgiveness as you're saying and and what we need to do i mean it's one thing i i'd note is we 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 want not you know, i'm speaking to you i'm much more general than that we want we tend to want quick solutions and most of these patterns my guess with you i don't know anything about your history but except maybe what you shared at the retreat but just a little bit but my guess is that the, those patterns have been around a long time. They didn't start last week, you know. I mean, typically, you know, the, the, some of them go back to very early childhood. They've been the, the way we've learned to deal with whatever, you know, we learned through our parents or from others or conclusions we're drawing from, from the world that to be safe I need to be harsh to myself because if I'm not I'm going to screw up and fail and end up in a ditch etc etc you know all of that the way the mind goes so so these have been go typically been going here for a long time they've they've become habits of mind 
And so in order to change them, we tend to need, it doesn't happen or, you know, just like that. We tend to need to keep going back, keep bringing kindness and keep coming back with forgiveness and self-compassion. So that the way I tend to look at it is that the awareness becomes strong enough and deep enough and large enough to hold even the most harshest thoughts and judgments so that we're, we're kind of it's like we've got this muscle of self-judgment that is really like Charles Atlas so you know it's really really strong and a muscle of awareness and compassion is like the flimsy guy that gets sand kicked in his face in those 1950s or 40s or whatever it was kind of ads you know um and what we're wanting to do is wanting to strengthen i mean just a metaphor but just wanting to strengthen the 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 power of compassion and loving kindness and awareness what you know you could call loving awareness large enough so that it's it can it can hold even those habitual harsh thoughts and so um you know teacher i've been you know very connected with over the last few years rob babea speaks about cultivating creating an inner reservoir of well-being so, so we, it's like we're building the reservoir, you know, through our training, through going on retreats, through practice, through continually both in meditation and in daily life. Just making that reservoir large enough that we have the resources when the difficulties come up to meet it. It's like we're not like, oh, my God, this is I'm, I'm such a terrible person. It's like, oh, I'm a terrible person. Thank you for that thought. Thank you very much for that. For, for you know for trying to take care of me but we've got this right now and can I come back to that kindness so it's really just kind of keep strengthening what you know already know is the wise way and wise and compassionate way of going and just keep strengthening those capacities does that how does that land um It, uh, it lands, it does land, and it feels, I, I, it resonates very much so. Um, and thank you for that, because it is, uh, you know, build, like you said, building the reservoir, because it's years, right? Years of, years and years, in my whole life, my whole life. Um, so the, so the, the muscle of self-judgment and should-haves is quite large comparatively to the you know, to the loving kindness and self-compassion that I've been working on um, just over the last, you know, couple of years or so. Um, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's a really, really important, it's a very important one, um, just because that looms so large for, for so many, you know, the self-judgment and, and, and the compassion to recognize, having, cultivating the compassion Rec to recognize that these have been here a long time they're not easy they're very you know often very very entrenched and and recognizing that they, it, that at some stage in our life they may have been functional they may have been what we needed to get us through whatever we were go going through so being compassionate to that you know to re recognize and then they get established and they get very strong and 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 sticky and is a what is a word i'm thinking not thinking of but really they, they, they not not tenuous but <laughs> another word like that but the hard hard to hard to um you know, hard to deal with, hard to hold. So we need a lot of practice, a lot of kindness, a lot of awareness to, to uh, to help us um, help us meet and hold hold all of that. So thank you, Gabriella. Tangled, <laughs> Bob says tangled, tangled up in blue. Yeah, thank you. We do. It, it comes back to the tangles uh, a lot. Um, build my reservoir. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You're not alone. Sarah says their survival resources kept us safe as kids. Many of them are. Yeah. Thank you. 
Um, maybe it's a time for time for one more sharing, and then we'll we'll have a meditation and do some announcements to finish. Um, Was Sarah, did you have something? Did you raise your hand? You're you're on mute. Sarah, you're on you're on mute. Well, I saw Bob had his hand raised, and I already oh, had. Oh, Bob! Hand, oh, so I'd like to no, no, Sarah, Sarah, please go ahead. Go ahead, Sarah. I guess I just want please. to say quickly, like I'm still struggling, and and just really want to take a, you know, a medicine or a, like just feeling like so aware of all this in my head again like you said in the meditation we're always privileging the head really needing more body practices to bring myself to the compassion and the you know that's what's so hard is knowing it but more and more how we do it like i from the retreat said every time I go, I'm going to like even the smile you told us or but I always feel like I need a somatic resource because I do believe that these all all like Gabriella was saying the intensity of the negativity or the fix it and then a speediness is a survival resource. So it's so hard, I think the challenge of actually acting, I feel like it's easy to start cultivating a different relationship with myself, but in that moment around others in a relationship is where so hard. I yeah. blurt things out. So <laughs> that's sorry. Yeah, I mean, I think it's so important what you're emphasizing that it mean everything you're saying, just to recognize that it that it's hard, that it's difficult. And which is why we need to keep, you know, keep connected with our deepest intentions, you know. Because if we don't, if we lose track of our intentions, we will get swept up in the, you know, in the waves of life, you know, we'll get pull, pulled into things. Inevitably, we will be. And we can come back. So coming back to our intention, remembering what matters most, and then this, the training. And it needs a lot of compassion because we're not going to be able to keep seeing ourselves getting pulled back and then coming back again, pull back, um, unless we unless we can hold it with kindness to develop the resources, which would is really a lot of what we're doing is we're, we're building the resources to be able to. It's almost like re reprogram our minds in many ways, and and what you're saying about the body is so important, Sarah. That um, that we live so much in our heads and we develop our, our brains and up you know you know but the mind if you like the in in the kind of the thinking analytical we in in ways that are very very powerful and can be very very helpful um but if they're not if the learning isn't deepened and become become to become part of our overall consciousness and the body and the heart are essential to that if we don't do that then the cognitive understanding will not be very valuable to us you know it'll be a certain it's helpful to a certain extent but it really won't be transformative it won't bring about that kind of deep change that we're that we're we're practicing to you know to to cultivate to realize you know the deepest freedom that the buddhist teachings point to um and so yes we have to have ways of of doing that you know so so just the hand on the heart you know coming back to the breath coming back to the body just keep coming back what am i noticing what am i feeling what am i feeling in my body right now and the more and more we can become attuned to it, it's like tuning, you know, a radio, just tuning into the sensations, tuning, tuning into the feelings, tuning into it all. So, yes, everything you said, Sarah, and just to encourage you and all of us, you know, just to keep keep remembering that 
we can always begin again um, and that these teachings are transformative um, you know not that we believe it but we can see it in our own practice you know maybe you know that that saying from Arjun Chah, let go a little and you'll experience a little freedom. Let go a lot and you'll experience a lot of peace, a lot of freedom. Let go completely and you'll experience complete freedom, complete peace. Your struggle with the world will be at an end. So that's where we're, move, we're moving towards that, that, that letting go, that letting go completely. But we we'll probably need to do a lot of little little letting letting goes you know and, or maybe a lot at times to be able to to let go completely so thank you sarah and uh, and bob did you want to share anything just very quickly i love the moment when ruan asked the question and you said it's almost like asking the question is the path and it, it, in that case, it was about what do I do if I'm cold in meditation? And it reminded me a little bit of the, the, the journey of the Buddha in terms of going all the way toward asceticism is not the path where you're uncomfortable. <laughs> and yet going all the way toward, you know, indulging is also not the path. And somebody in the comments said something about a middle way. And the only way to find that, and it's a life's path, is just keep asking the question. So I, I loved coming back to that. And that was a moment that was sort of insightful to me that I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't think I've seen Marina's um, uh, suggestions. Uh, Jerry, Lynn, Jerry re referred to them, wonderful suggestions. Um, uh, from Marina bringing the body, mind and heart into balance. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, shall we um, shall we sit for a few minutes and then um, have some announcements? So we have maybe eight or ten minutes to sit to internalize and metabolize. That's a word that can be a helpful one. Whatever, whatever insights, whatever. understandings may have come out of our time together today. Just taking the time to come back down into the body, opening to whatever feelings, sensations are present right now. Having the orientation of kindness and awareness, kindness and acceptance, just aware of what's present with the with the wish, with the intention to meet it with kindness, with acceptance. You might envision your awareness as being just more than what's in your head, or even more than what's in your body, but you know, larger, imagine, envision your whole room, maybe going beyond it, you know, as far as you want, wish, to include the whole of the, the sky. And just everything that, that comes up can be held in this open space of awareness, this compassionate awareness.
notice the feelings that come up and just let them come and go in this open space of awareness. Like birds flying through the sky, the feelings come, stay for a while and then pass. The thoughts too coming, and when they're seen, they just dissolve again, like clouds dissolving in a wide open sky. Thoughts, when seen, can be entirely unproblematical, whatever the content of the thought is, because they're just coming and going. It's only when we get hooked on thoughts and they become sticky. You know, we get pulled into a certain kind of thinking, planning or ruminating or judging, worrying. Then they become sticky, they become a problem. They feel like they're a problem. We're getting pulled by them rather than, than being aware of them. But all we need to do is just to be aware. Okay, worried thoughts. Let them come, let them go. Without fueling them. You know, you see yourself planning the week ahead. Nothing wrong with that. But it can take on an energy of, you know, kind of craving energy of, I've got to do this, I've got to plan, otherwise I'm not going to be able to get everything done. And, so it has that energy. So when you see that, just to notice, let it come, let it go. Come back, feel that maybe tension in your body. Breathe into it, make space for it. Let your breathing help keep you balanced, stable. Well, you're just taking a deeper breath or two when it's helpful. Or just using the breath as a focus, come back to. back if it's helpful to this open spacious awareness everything can come and go within this wide open space of awareness finish with Antonio Machado's poem, Last Night As I Was Sleeping. Last night as I was sleeping, I dreamt, marvelous error, that a spring was breaking out in my heart. I said, 
along which secret aqueduct, O oh water, are you coming to me, water of a new life that I have never drunk? Last night as I was sleeping, I dreamt marvelous error that I had a beehive here inside my heart and the golden bees were making white combs and sweet honey from my old failures. Last night, as I was sleeping, I dreamt marvelous error that a fiery sun was giving light inside my heart. It was fiery because I felt warmth as from a hearth and sun because it gave light and brought tears to my eyes. Last night, as I slept, I dreamt marvelous error that it was God I had here inside my heart. 